welcome to the Caspian Podcast, the podcast of the Caspian Post with me, Mark Elliott. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Caspian Podcast with me, Mark Elliott. Today, we're talking to Svante Cornell. Now, I've been trying to work it out. You, you discover, describe yourself as a recovering academic, which I love. And you, uh, you work at the Central Asia Caucasus Institute uh, in DC. But now you're back in Sweden, where you have another hat as the director of the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Now, have I got that right? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, and it's marvellous to see. We we have worked together in the past, and I I mean, I always love to read your work. I I, I have, haven't kept up with as much as I should, but um, just to give a flavour, we'll look at two or three subjects through this talk, first of which is um, about Georgia. Now, I know yes. you wrote a very important or edited a very important book about the 2008 war. Yes. And I, I, I gather you you really saw how much Russia had a long-term sort of aggressive policy towards Georgia uh, mm -hmm. from the time of the Soviet Union onwards. Um, and in fact, you studied that in, in your PhD as well. So, so how, you know, more than 10 years later, how has that sort of situation changed in your opinion? Um, well, it has and it hasn't. You know, one of the, one of the points we make in that book is that it would be a mistake. You know, people call it a five-day war, for example. That gives you the idea that something just started on August 7 or 8 of 2008 and ended five days later. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there's been a conflict between Russia and Georgia that started, if you want to pick a date, probably April 9 of 1989, when the Soviet military put down the uh, Georgian you know, demonstrations for independence. Uh, it's gone through different phases, some of which were more violent, like the wars in Abkhazia, South Ossetia in the early 90s. It got through phases where Russia was really using more diplomatic, economic, political, subversive means to, to influence Georgia and basically, which is what they want to do to get control back over, over Georgia as a state. Uh, and then we had this extremely violent phase in 2008, but on, it was preceded by a couple of uh, military interventions by Russia in, 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 the, in the preceding years, minor, but still very significant. And now we're in a phase where Russia, if you will, you know, threw the kitchen sink at Georgia, to use that expression, back in 2008. And, and you could still debate whether they succeeded or not. That depends on what you think they were trying to achieve. If you think what they're trying to achieve was just to control those breakaway provinces, yes, they succeeded. But they really had a lot of control over those before, which is why I think the real aim was to essentially deal the Saakashvili government in Georgia such a defeat that it would never recover and that Russia would be able to basically come in and, and, and take control indirectly of Georgia and stop it from all its, in, its interest in Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. That failed. Uh, and therefore, the conflict continues, uh, and it continues in several ways. Georgia uh, is still the subject of these Russian efforts of moving boundaries, various shenanigans in the borders with the occupied territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but I think the main theater right now is Georgian politics, where the, um, you know, the Saakashvili uh, government was by no means perfect. It had its flaws, um, but it really um, put an emphasis on the development and strengthening of Georgia as a sovereign state. What we see now is, is a government that doesn't have some of the deficiencies of the Saakashvili government um, in terms of being, um, shall we say, very assertive, both internally and externally with what it was trying to do. But this government uh, has no real strategic direction, I would say, and is also regressing in terms of the re-emergence of corruption uh, and also in terms of a much more ambivalent stance on what it wants to do regarding Georgia's place in the world. And in a way that, 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 that is something that fits with some of, of, of Russia's interests. Now, I, I'm not saying that they're, they are on a way to achieving what they wanted, but Georgia has become much less of a a thorn in the face for Mo for Moscow compared mm. to what it used to be. I know one of the things uh, for, for listeners that aren't aware of it, this, the, the issue of moving the borders. I, I know a few years ago, at least, you kept hearing that the, the border fence had just been shifted a few hundred mm -hmm. metres. Yeah. Um, and it seemed to always coincide with any kind of political move in Tbilisi that, that Russia didn't like. Um, Absolutely. And is that still happening? Sure, these type of things are still happening. Now, you know... The, the, the thing with the Russians is, I think, uh, not everybody understands is that they have a big toolbox. 
Uh, and in that toolbox are many different things, just like you and I might have a hammer and a wrench and a screwdriver. Uh, the Russians have border posts, they have subversion, they have the financing of pro-Russian political parties, they have political assassinations, they have a whole, this is the thing we nowadays call hybrid warfare. And a colleague of mine, Nicholas Nilsson, published a report for us about three years ago, I think that was called Russian Hybrid Tactics in Georgia, which goes into all of these different tactics that Russia has been utilizing. And I think, to your question, there are only so many times you can move a border post. So they are, they're moving on to other things. And I think right now, uh, a couple of the main things is the uh, the support for anti-Western, not pro-Russian, but anti-Western political uh, organizations in Georgia, as well as political uh, anti-Western forces within the ruling elite of Georgia. I think that's what Russia is basically trying to do. In a way, softening up what used to be the most pro-Western state in, in in the whole region. Now, obviously, the fact that any uh, any appetite for enlargement on the part of the EU and NATO has basically gone out the window obviously makes this so much easier because the the prospect for many Georgians of getting closer association with the West is increasingly distant, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about Central Asia next, because I know you've sure. written books about the, the... But just before we get to that, I am just fascinated how you as a Swede uh, became so interested um, in that area. Because as I gather, like you and I were both very interested in the Caucasus and Central Asia at a time where it was sort of not very well known uh, in, in Western Europe. Could you just, in, in a couple of minutes, just tell sure. us how you got to this position? Well, I happened to, because of my family's and my father's posting at the Swedish embassy in Turkey, in Ankara, I happened to attend a university in Turkey just at the time when... Um, after the Soviet Union collapsed and the first uh, cohorts, large cohorts of students from Central Asia and Azerbaijan began studying at, uh, at Turkish universities. And I found that, uh, you know, it was a fascinating time. And um, I, I, I guess that influenced me. And uh, then I realized at some point that most of the people that work on this part of the world come at it from a Russian angle. They speak Russian, they have studied the Soviet Union and so on. And that, like it or not, gives you a certain set of eyeglasses, if you like. And I thought, well, maybe somebody who doesn't have the Soviet perspective should also be studying the, this part of the world. And I also thought, you know, everybody is dealing with Eastern Europe, the Baltics, uh, the Balkans. Uh, what's the next wave? And I figured that this is going to be the next wave. And I suppose maybe I've overstayed it now since I've been dealing doing it for 25 years. Maybe the next wave is somewhere else at this point. But, you know. When, well, uh, I, I know what you mean. I remember um, I wrote my first uh, uh, book about travel in central asia back in 94 95 mm -hmm, imagining mm -hmm. that within a year or two this would be booming like thailand as yes a quick, yes and i i it, it was amazing to me actually how little interest the world seemed to take huh. quite some time yeah. yes well i think that might be changing but we'll see but as you see now one of your your books that um is about the long game on on the Silk Road, you've, right. also, you've also edited a book about um, uh, new new steps being taken in Uzbekistan under the, the right. regime since 2016. And I, we did have uh, Shahida Tulanganova, whose name I, I managed to mangle when she did a, a podcast with us. Um, now, she was very negative about the changes. She said, well, the, they were small and, and, and hadn't gone very far. But I, I, my feeling from your book was that you were a little bit more positive. And indeed, my, my feelings had been quite positive, although then seeing what's been happening in the Fergana Valley recently, mm. that's also somewhat worrying. So again, I know we have a very short podcast, but what are your basic feelings about the way things are moving in Central Asia? Well, I think it, everything depends on your perspective. And this is, this is always a problem studying this region, which, which we come across when we talk about you know, Azerbaijan, first of all. Uh, Uzbekistan, the, uh, Kazakhstan, the other states of Central Asia. Uh, if you expect them to be like a Western European state anytime soon, you're going to be disappointed. If you take a baseline of what they have been and the evolution they've been through, and also the situation around them. You know, if you have China to the east, Russia to the north, Afghanistan to the south, or Pakistan, uh, that's not an environment that's very conducive to the building of Western style liberal democracy with uh, full protection of human rights. So I think we have to see everything in context. Uh, and I, by the way, I should say that I have a full appreciation for the fact that there are people who live in these countries, 
who uh, have to experience the negative sides of the mm. regimes or the bureaucracies or the type of states that exist there. And I have a, I fully uh, recognize and appreciate that they, uh, they want things to change much faster than I do. Uh, that said, I think uh, we have also seen um, across this part of the world that revolutionary change doesn't seem to work. Uh, the so-called Arab Spring was supposed to bring in you know, liberal democracy mm. suddenly across the Arab world. Well, we see that either the Muslim Brotherhood and their likes have come to power or we've had civil wars. The only exception being Tunisia. So that suggests to me that revolutionary change is a big gamble. And again, that's a gamble that outsiders can make, but for people living there, I think that they have to bear the consequences of that. Uh, so I think you know, in the re realm of the realistic, we see that there is uh, there are different paces of evolutionary change. Some in in some places that's been glacial, if you will, in terms of the speed. Uh, Turkmenistan might be one example, uh, and then there are others that are that are much more encouraging. And I think the big picture of what's happening in in Central Asia are two things. First, that uh, uh, Uzbekistan really changed. First of all, its approach to the world. Uh, with the passing of President Karimov. President Karimov, you know, uh, he experienced, uh, since you mentioned the Fergana Valley, the Islamist uprising in Fergana back in the late Soviet period. And this colored his entire worldview and made mm -hmm. him uh, the kind of person who's always saw the glasses half empty. Okay. Uh, he always saw dangers lurking and uh, wondered, how do, I, how do I avoid these dangers? And therefore his appetite for for any kind of experimenting, for reform, for change, which is always, you know, opening the door to, 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 to dangers, uh, was extremely limited. Uh, he was extremely risk averse in that sense and wanted to protect the state at all costs. Part of that is also that across this region, we have to remember that there were no states. Uh, and in my opinion, you cannot build democracy without having a state. Uh, that ultimately very frequently leads to chaos uh, and very often to civil war. And by the way, that's not something I say. That's what basically the political science research, research of the likes of Jack Snyder, who talk about From Voting to Violence, I think was the name of his very well-received book back in the 1990s, that countries that are in transition to democracy are the ones most at risk of experiencing conflict, not, of, not fully consolidated authoritarian states. So I think what's been happening in Central Asia is that over the first, let's say, 20, 25 years of independence, they built the foundation, which is the state. Mm -hmm. And after having built that foundation, it's time to move on to building the second stage, which is to build a more inclusive uh, political system and economic system, by the way. And these things are very much interlinked in Central Asia, where the state actually works to, to protect and help its, its, its citizens rather than just control them, as was the, the case in the, in the early days. Now, uh, has this process moved fast enough? Of course not. But I think what's been happening in, in, in Central Asia, and particularly in Uzbekistan after the passing of Islam Karimov, uh, has, been, has been a very dramatic change. Um, now, everything has not been implemented, but there is this expression about taking the genie out of the bottle. And I think President Mirziyoyev, uh, interestingly, after having spent 13 years as Mr. Karimov's prime minister, starts unleashing change. Now, he does it first in terms of, uh, of totally changing Uzbekistan's approach to its neighbors, uh, which was always host quite uh, mm. uh, hostile, uh, especially yeah. towards the smaller neighbors. Yes, because I always I, I always see this through a tr as a travel writer. I always see it in a travel perspective. Yes. But just the idea that you weren't any more allowed to cut through the little exclaves yeah. or you weren't borders had gone from being very porous mm -hmm. to and and that is in a day-to-day -day sense a very very difficult situation for for local Absolutely. people as well as for travelers well and president mirziyoyev in his first year in power he resolved all, basically all of uzbekistan's border problems with its neighbors and adopted this very positive uh, engagement and outreach approach to, to neighbors mm. like tajikistan kyrgyzstan with which they had had a lot of trouble in the past, and he also very importantly reached out to Kazakhstan, where there had been a certain rivalry for primacy, if you will, in Central Asia. Mm. And now I think there's a sense that that, that of, of course, is not totally gone, but there is a sense both in the leaderships in Kazakhstan and in Uzbekistan that, you know, 
if we take care, if we take charge of this region together, we can do great things. Whereas if we don't, the outsiders, the Chinese, the Russians and others are going to play us against each other. And I think that's unleashed a completely different regional environment. Now, on the domestic front of obviously changing, I mean, a president can change a lot in foreign relations just by virtue of the, the power they have in foreign relations. That same thing is true in the United States, by the way. Whereas in domestic political affairs in, in the US, you have certain checks and balances which are in Congress and in the courts. Well, and in a country in, like Uzbekistan uh, or everywhere in this region, you have other types of checks and balances that just don't happen to be democratic in nature. These are the oligarchs, uh, the entrenched interests in the bureaucracy, in the cotton industry, in the economy and what have you, which means that it's a lot slower. But if you, if you, if you had told me back in 2016 or 17 that the state security service uh, or state security ministry rather in um, in Uzbekistan would be dismantled and that the president would label them as mad dogs, uh, uh, I wouldn't have believed it. Now, I think this is a major change. That doesn't mean that Uzbekistan is anytime soon going to turn into Denmark, but I think it, 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 all these are very meaningful changes for a lot of the people living in Uzbekistan, mm. not perhaps primarily for the, should we say, uh, Western funded NGOs that are interested in political representation, because this is not a reform. These reforms are not primarily intended, definitely not in the short term to make the country a democracy, but I think they are intended to make the country more, the country's government more responsive to their citizens, because I think as in Kazakhstan and as in Azerbaijan, the leaderships of these countries, which are the ones that really matter in the region, have recognized that you cannot survive as a regime, as a government, unless you have the legitimacy that comes with, uh, with being able to deliver something to your citizens. Because of the era of high oil prices where you could actually do that, you were, because they were able to, to, to deliver constantly rising living standards, uh, that's come to an end, and therefore the government has to deliver in different ways. And I think that's that's a that's a, I see that as a major change. Now it's going to take a lot of you know steps forward and steps back before before we see the uh, the end of that progress. But I think it's a very yeah. meaningful change. Well, I think this this will take us neatly back across the Caspian, where um, perhaps the knottiest of all the problems um, is. Uh, has indeed for a long time been uh, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia. Now, I this is a little bit long time ago that you wrote this Azerbaijan out of in, after independence. Yes. But but a theme there, and a theme that I that you touched on here when talking about Central Asia, is how when you allow outside powers to divide and rule, as it were, that then you have a problem. So mm -hmm. so let's look now at uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia. We the war of 2020 apparently has reset things border-wise back to how how it looks on the map, how the legal situation is. A few, there's still a few occupied villages in in the Gazak region, but generally the borderlines are back to normal. So now, um, I think it's um, the Armenian uh, Gerard Liberidian had said back at the time when he was a, a government. Mm. Um, uh, advisor that he at the first after the first war didn't want russia involved yeah and and azerbaijan and armenia much as they uh, were had been at war didn't want russia involved but now right. this time um it seems that russia has been it has been a tripartite uh, settlement to end the war russia mm -hmm. is involved there are russian peacekeepers on the ground um but then there was turkey involved now this is an incredibly difficult situation, I know, but again, in a very broad brush strokes look, how do you see the future? Do, I mean, could we look towards hopefully one day Armenia and Azerbaijan actually working together like uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan? I mean, it's a much bigger jump, obviously, um, and, and, and thereby developing the Caucasus, or are we looking at a constant Russian interference that might actually end up maintaining a sense of tension in, in for years to come well i think the uh, the former would be uh, advisable but the second is more likely uh, i think uh, you could compare this in some ways to the french and german relations 150 years ago um, or so where the question is really when are you tired of fighting wars over mm. alsace lorraine in that in, in that case and over nagorno karabakh and surrounding areas in, in this case, 
And I suppose for the Armenians back after 1994, they thought, well, now we fought the last war and we got, well, actually they got way too much, which is probably was the problem. They, they bit off more than they could chew, as I've said on many occasions. And what was baffling to me was how the Armenian leadership after, especially after 2018, under Mr. Pashinyan, um, raised the level of their rhetorical um, their rhetoric in the conflict without seeing the danger on the wall that this was going to backfire in a very big way. And I think that's, that's the type of soul searching that should be done in Armenia. I'm not sure that it is. And now the Azerbaijanis think that they basically fought the last war and we'll have to see. It seems to me that uh, this defeat is of such a, such a magnitude for Armenia and essentially, if you will, uh, you know, they, Ar Ar Armenia sacrificed a lot for the sake of maintaining territorial control over Karabakh. They've been circumvented by pipelines, by road, by major infrastructure projects, by basically everything going on in the region. And all they had to hold on to was Karabakh that was more important to them than anything else. Well, they sacrificed the independence of their country for practical purposes for the sake of Karabakh. And now they don't have that. Now they really don't have anything. Uh, so the question is, how will Armenia deal with this? And I think that is going to take a number of years to be sorted out domestically in Armenia. And I don't think there is any way to know how that's going to end. It seems to me that we're still in a hyper-nationalistic environment in which the voices that existed are saying, well, we have, we're a small country, we have to live in peace with our neighbors, is for the time being weaker than the forces that, the revanchist forces that somehow think that they're going to fight another war. Um, maybe that will change, maybe it won't. So I think that remains to be seen. In the case of Azerbaijan, I think what we're seeing is a euphoria following the victory, which after 25 years of humiliation is perfectly understandable. In some ways it's pleasant. There are also unpleasant parts of this, uh, of this euphoria in terms of, um, uh, of the ways that it's being expressed. But it seems to me much more likely that, uh, that the, the voices in Azerbaijan, well, you know, there are on the one hand voices that are continuing to humiliate the Armenians, and then there are other voices, sometimes the same people, saying that we should reach out to them and cooperate. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be much easier for Azerbaijan to, to, to pursue a more uh, accommodationist uh, policy. Turkey, of course, plays a key role because the Turkish-Armenian border really is now there is no real reason for that to remain closed. I don't think even Azerbaijan would, would want it to re remain closed. And I think an economic integration with, with Turkey would perhaps do more than anything else to gradually shift this uh, siege mentality that exists in Armenia regarding anything that is Turkish or Azerbaijani. And that might be the best bet for, for, for changing this in the long run. So, um, so in just a couple of seconds, are you optimistic or... And what sort of time scale do you, do you think do you think this 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 um the, the maybe appetite for war has finished or do you think we need to brace ourselves for further conflict in the near future well that's when the the question of russia comes in because obviously russia is not in in karabakh uh, because of the goodness of their heart they are there because they viewed this as an opportunity much as you indicate to have territorial control essentially in, in one of the few places in the Caucasus in the former Soviet Union where they didn't. Uh, in fact, if sometimes I've been, I've been saying that this, in this recent war, Armenia lost the occupied territories to Azerbaijan and they lost Karabakh to Russia. Uh, and I think that's increasingly becoming the case. And I think what we're going to see over time is how what Russia is doing in Karabakh will look very much like what Russia has been doing in places like Transnistria, like Abkhazia, like South Ossetia. Uh, we're already hearing about distribution of Russian passport. I think it's a foregone conclusion that that's going to happen. I think it's similarly a foregone conclusion that the leadership in Stepanakert, which is already tightly connected to Moscow, will be even more so, even more under the direct influence of the Russian security services, which is going to drive a wedge between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, by the way at least in terms of the political leadership and Karabakh and its leadership will therefore be used by Moscow when necessary against Armenia, when necessary against Azerbaijan. Um, so the question is, what do the Russians want to accomplish? The thing is, the biggest, the biggest fear of the Russians was always Western encroachment in this region. And I think it's very interesting to see that they've been able to accept a certain level of Turkish influence, uh, 
because after all, Turkey is de facto no longer a part of the Western alliance, and that made it somewhat acceptable to Moscow because at least it's not a it's not a Western power, just the way China's presence in, in, in Central Asia is being accepted by Moscow. Um, I think for that reason, as long as there is no direct Western encroachment, there may not be any Russian appetite for, for a new war. I should say that I don't think that Russia wanted this war. I think the Armenian uh, uh, leadership did so against the wishes of Moscow, uh, this escalation that led to the war. Um, but we'll have to see what, uh, what what happens. It's not easy to say. That's funny. Thank you so much. That's been an absolutely fascinating summation of three whole different sets of um, geopolitical issues. That's a pleasure. Um, it's really lovely to see you again. And I just to sign off, let's say you've been listening to the Caspian podcast with me, Mark Elliott and Svante Cornell. Thanks very much for listening and looking forward to meet you again uh, online very soon. Mm-hmm.